Thank you for joining us for this night's event. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm one of the event hosts located here in Portland, Oregon at Howl's Books. Uh, before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at Powell's.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social media and Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Dr. Jennifer Lincoln and Dr. Jen Gunter. Dr. Lincoln is a board certified OBGYN who currently practices as an OB hospitalist and an international board certified lactation consultant here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Dr. Lincoln loves using social media to provide evidence-based, easy to digest information while busting the many myths surrounding vaginal and reproductive health. She believes that breaking down the shame and stigma surrounding our bodies is the best way to become informed and empowered. Dr. Lincoln has been sharing her expertise as an OBGYN to her millions of followers on TikTok, and now in her accessible illustrated guide, she answers real questions about vaginal, sexual, and reproductive health for fans and new readers alike. Her book, Let's Talk About Down There, which just came out today, so happy little book birthday, is like the health class you wish you had. Think evidence-based, myth-busting sex ed where shame gets tossed out the window in a format that's as approachable as a 15-second video. Addressing topics such as hormones, menstrual cups, and birth control, all with the help of infographics and illustrations, Dr. Lincoln's vibrant handbook answers the question that you may be too embarrassed to ask, so you'll be empowered to make more informed health choices and truly care for yourself. Joining Dr. Lincoln in conversation this evening is Dr. Jen Gunther. Dr. Gunther is an internationally best-selling author, obstetrician, and, and gynecologist with more than three decades of experience as a vulva the vaginal disease expert. Her best-selling book, the vaginal, sorry, her best-selling book, The Vagina Bible, has been translated into 21 languages, and The Guardian calls her the world's most famous and outspoken gynecologist. She is also the host of the popular TED Collective podcast, Body Stuff with Dr. Jen Gunter, where she interviews fellow doctors about the lies you've been told and sold about your health, debunking some of the sick, stickiest, stickiest myths out there while helping you to understand how your body really works. Um, tonight's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question. Um, I believe there's an anonymous option as well if you don't feel comfortable uh, using your real name. As well as someone has typed a question that you would also like to know the answer to, please upload that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Uh, most importantly, please consider supporting Dr. Lincoln and Powell's by for, for purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy, let's talk about down there, along with a link to Dr. Gunther's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Uh, and I've also been notified you should, if this is gonna be a fun event, so it's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be some swearing and some other things. So if you would like to wear headphones, so not everyone knows your business, then that's okay too. Uh, Dr. Lincoln, Dr. Gunther, we are overjoyed to welcome you both this evening. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having us. And Jen, congratulations. Oh, thank you, Jen. I feel like we got the two Jens here tonight. We're both kind of obsessed with vaginas and vulvas and writing books about them now. So I could not think of a better person that I wanted to have this chat with. So thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're so busy. Oh, it's my pleasure. I was so thrilled when you asked. And actually today on Instagram, someone sent me a, a private message. I'm going to totally steal what they said. They said, oh my God, you guys are the OB Jens. <gasps> oh, okay. That is our next thing. <laughs> That's awesome. How did we not think of that? We're, okay. All right, that's like a t-shirt in the making. Okay, very good. We started our weekends, like we're all over it. All right. Yes. So, this book is so beautiful. It's just such a beautiful book. So I just, I want to start by um, you telling us about how the, how you came to conceive, there's going to be a lot of puns tonight, we came to conceive <laughs> this and tell us through the delivery process. Yes, it's a very, it's a very, it was an easier delivery than my other deliveries. Um, you know, it, this book just came out of, you know, just like you, you want to put information that people can understand and digest where they are. And we use social media and both of us have a really good audience there, but that's one place. And just as quickly as something goes viral, as we have a TikTok that explains birth control side effects or vaccines or whatever, it can fade into the background. And so a month later, somebody will say, hey, have you talked about Depo? And we'll say, yeah, you know, I have that. And it can be hard to find things. So I wanted to put it in book format. That way, when we have things just laying around like these books, if you have kids and you give it to them, or if it's on your nightstand, 
then it just becomes part of the conversation, just like our bodies ourselves, however many years ago, just like your book, The Vagina Bible, which I tell everybody is truly like the Bible and you should read it if you have one or if you love somebody who does. Um, and I wanted my book to be sort of like the, the TikTok version in book form. So it's Q&A, um, very easy to read very quickly. You can go right to your question that you have, or you can read a whole section like I need to understand periods. And that's one whole section. Or you can just go to your specific question. And it's so beautifully illustrated because I want it to be visual, just like our posts are, right? Like that's what draws people in. You only have a certain amount of time. And Charlotte Wilcox is, um, was my illustrator. And she was the only person I reached out to because I was following the Vagina Museum, which if people here do not know that there's a Vagina Museum in London, now you know, and I will go there one day. Uh, but she had her art on exhibition there and I saw her illustrations. And what I love about them is that they look like real labias. They look like real vulvas. The people have stretch marks. They have hair. Sometimes they bleed on their underwear, like, like real humans. And I wanted what was in my book to actually be representative and diverse and people to actually see themselves, which doesn't really happen in the magazines or the movies. Um, so yeah, so I conceived of this book after my friend, Willie Galloway, who also wrote a book and had um, wrote a great cookbook and pitched me to her agent who took a chance on me, Joy Tutela from the David Black Literary Agency. And we sold the book to Andrews McNeil Publishing, which was amazing and how much they let me have a say in what it looks like. And my editors and team there that we, they've learned more about vaginas in the past year than probably they bargained for. <laughs> um, probably just like your editors where they're like, wow, I didn't know all of this. And, um, and it's been so fun. It's just been, it's just been super great to see stuff to get put out into the world. So. Now I saw today, I think it was, on your TikTok that are you first generation college graduate? For, did you say that for you for Yeah, yeah you first one. So yeah. Favorite book too? Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I think, you know, I've always I've always wanted to go into medicine. I've always loved writing. I minored in English in college. Um, I remember I had this children's book pitch that I sent to a publisher in New York City. Um, I grew up in New York, but I remember thinking, oh, they'll, they'll totally publish this book when I was like 10. And they didn't, but they were very sweet how they let me down. But oh, they um, said the letter back. They did. They said, this sounds so great. And you're so cute and keep at it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> years later it worked out. So there we go. <laughs> um, and you also posted a picture a couple of days ago, um, a high school, was that a high school photo? High sure school? was. That was my, yes, my graduation. Oh, yeah. Photo. Right. Yeah. I, was doing, I wasn't wearing enough sunscreen back then, but yes. I <laughs> went to a Catholic high school, is that right? All girls Catholic high school. All girls Catholic high school. So did you tell me about the sex ed or absence of sex ed that you got in high school? Yeah, what sex ed? What? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was none. Um, we learned the extreme basics. I'm sure you're so surprised. Um, it was a class in 11th grade, I think, or 12th grade called morality. Oh. And I wish I, <laughs> I wish I had the textbook, Jen, because being the typical type A, you know, I highlighted everything and I was like, okay, this is how you're a good person and da, da, da. And it told you that if you had sex before marriage, you were, you know, you were degrading yourself. And I'm not saying that you should not, not do that if that's something that's important to you, but it was sold to us as you have to be pure and you have to be perfect. And if you do any of this stuff before marriage, you, you know exactly where you're going. We were never taught about birth control. We were never taught about um, consent. That's adorable. Um, we were told, and I, this is true, that instead of having sex with our boyfriends, we should make, um, we should make a salad with them, which now I find very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was taught by Sister Claire. She was very sweet, but I don't think she had a whole lot of experience. So and um, Sister Claire told you to get your salad tossed. Sorry. She sure did. Yeah. And, it, you know, and of course, because I was so pure back then, I didn't understand why this was funny and give it a few years. And I was like, wait a minute, did a nun just tell me what? <laughs> and then I went to college and I realized just how little I knew. So, yeah, it was not it was not exactly the kind of education that I would hope for my kids or other people to like actually understand how their bodies work. And it was that whole purity culture that you and I talk about all the time. Which yeah. Is really useful. Or, you know, if you're used. 
And I think one of the, the really one of the common myths that, that I'm, I'm sure you're out, well, I know you're out there debunking and you talk about all the time is that, you know, education doesn't lead people, you know, first of all, it's fine to do whatever you want with your body, but, but education is not something that's going to make people have more sex, just like telling someone how to drive a car. It doesn't make them, you know, you know, want to want to drive more cars that, you know, people just want information. So, right. so and you know, abstinence only education doesn't work, right? We literally have the data to show that it does nothing in terms of delaying sexual partners, limiting sexual partners. It's one of the biggest wastes of money that our government has, has invested in. Yeah. So, so is there um, anything that you weren't, you didn't get in the book that you really wanted to get in? Like, you're like, oh, cause you know, you got to cut things and edit things down yeah. and you have different directions and, you know, so, cause you have to have a vision. So is there something that didn't get in the book that you wanted to talk about at all? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah. So in my book, I cover periods, birth control, care down there, going to the doctor and possibly pregnant, which is a lot of topics. And yeah, you can't get to everything. And so things that I didn't cover, I didn't go, cause I've had people say, well, do you cover anything about perimenopause and postmenopause? And I say, you know, I didn't, but I have this friend who did and you should get her book, The Menopause Manifesto. So I'm just kind of shunting them over to you, which is, you know, putting a plug in for you. Um, but I would say, I mean, my book is really broad. It didn't specifically dive into things. So I've had people who've said, you know, do you talk about vaginismus and vulvodynia? And I do not in a super detailed way, but I do mention some of these things. And when it comes to the pregnancy chapter, it's very much, again, to my audience who's asking questions like, could I be pregnant? When can I get pregnant? What should I do if I'm pregnant? But it's not at all delving into the, let's talk about pregnancy things, which I'm thinking maybe that could be the next book. But, um, but yeah, and I think that it's my audience. I, what I included were topics that people asked me, kept asking me over and over again. And the ones that I could cover on TikTok, but I couldn't get into enough. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, we could write, we could write anthologies, you know? <laughs> what is the most common question you get asked on TikTok? Do you know? Do you have an idea? Would, well, the most common thing that I get other than, you know, can you tell me if I'm pregnant, which you cannot diagnose it in a direct message. And I wish that I could, but I could not. Um, a lot of times it's, um, is this normal in terms of periods? We do a terrible job of educating people with uterus about what is normal in terms of periods. You know, we tell them once a month, five to seven days, blah, blah, blah. But people are not getting the education that like, you shouldn't be dying from your period or if you have to miss school or if you don't get any periods at all. Cause some people are like, well, that's cool. Cause I don't really want a period. Like we, you and I know as OBGYNs, we consider the period a vital sign. And that means it's vital. And if it's absent or it's too frequent or it's heavy, we need to know about it. But so many people, I think they either don't know that they can talk about it or they are embarrassed or they're just brushed off like, oh, it'll be fine in a few years. Take some ibuprofen and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So I know, I'm sure you see this too. Just a lot of people who feel like they, they have asked, but they haven't gotten the answers they need. And I think that that's a whole issue into and of itself. Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons that happens. I mean, first of all, obviously there's many healthcare professionals that are dismissive and that's absolutely wrong. Yes. Um, yep. But also it's, I always tell people, you know, a doctor's visit is often 15 minutes. What can you do in yep. 15 minutes? You can't make dinner in 15 minutes. I can't even make a grocery list in 15 minutes. So we're set people up for failure. And then also two people are, you know, often graduating to, from high school with very little baseline knowledge. And so they don't even have the baseline knowledge, even if you had the perfect 15 minutes with the perfect doctor to sort totally. of, you know, be able to take it in. So I think that's where, where, you know, like your channel is so vital because people can see the information sort of over and over again, kind of coming up mm -hmm. and it starts to stick and their friend sends it to them. And, you know, right. then, you know, so I think that, it, and your, your videos are so short and snappy and I just, I love them. So if you're not following Jen, which I'm sure you are because you're here, but if you're not, you follow her on TikTok and Instagram too. Oh, you're sweet. And then, yeah, same thing. Follow Jen, um, especially on Twitter. And you, you have these TikToks. I love that they'll just randomly, they just go so viral. Like you had the one about discharge and what it does to your underwear and like you just post it and boom, and it takes off. And I love it. And I will say the other question that I get a lot in that vein, right? So we do a terrible job in terms of how our healthcare system set up. 15 minutes, sterile environment. It's not ideal. And I can say that as a consumer of healthcare too. So what fills that void? It's the holistic, um, big natural that you and I call it, kind of the holistic, um, alternative, complementary medicine arena, which I'm not saying that these things are necessarily bad, some of them, but 
it's them filling in the gap of we'll listen to you and we have an hour and and that can be great, but what isn't great is then when they prey on non-evidence-based treatments. So the other thing I'll get asked a ton is, is this supplement okay? Should I take this to detox? Should I buy this program? And you and I spend how much of our time trying to tell people that this is, there is no data to support this. And this is just as bad as big pharma making money, except they are directly taking your cash and profiting. Whereas if I prescribe birth control, I don't get any money for that. So it's this weird um, you know, this isn't okay, but this is because it's in a beautiful package and beautiful marketing. And it sucks because it's hard to know what's legit and what's not, you know, I mean, even I have to look stuff up. I'm like, I don't know, you know? Well, and a lot of times too, you know, unfortunately with supplements, there are a few that we recommend, like if you're over 50, we might recommend vitamin D. So then it gets right. really confusing for people. Like, well, how do you know which one? But right. well, let's, let's talk a little bit about one of the things that I hate the most, which I know you hate the most too, is this concept of post birth control pill syndrome. Yes. I know it's like, <sighs> it's a deep breath. and what I want people who are listening to hear, we are not saying that you might not have side effects when you come that you know it, it can take a little bit for your cycle to get back you may have mood swings things are could be different so when we healthcare providers say post birth control syndrome is not real we're not saying we're not listening to you if anything i think you should be excited that we say that because we're not labeling you as a syndrome and we're seeing you in front of us and saying okay you're having bad headaches or you're having issues with acne let me deal with that instead of pre prescribing you this blanket supplement that will cost $300 a month and is a lot of stuff that hasn't been tested um, and I just find it really predatory because if we believe, if, if the people who are selling this believe in it so much, Jen, why don't they do the studies? Yeah. Well, I and mean, it is so predatory because exactly right. Because if you develop acne after stopping the pill, it's because the pill was treating your acne. It's not that stopping the pill caused acne. And, and, you know, it's sort of the same thing said different ways, but right. you expect a healthcare provider not to say it that way. But, you know, it right. comes that down to sort of one of the, you know, one of the core tenets that I have is that. You know, if somebody is selling you a product, you can't get health information about that product. So if somebody's got a supplement for something to do with birth control pills, then you know what? You can't listen to them to anything about contraception or about how you feel on stopping the pills because they're biased. Right. That's like listening to big pharma talk about antidepressants. Right. Yeah. And it's the, the thing I think that is really heinous is the whole idea of you're harming yourself when you're on birth control. And we know from really good data that using birth control doesn't cause fertility issues down the line. And yet... So many of these people who are selling these supplements are making you afraid that you're breaking your body, that you're doing something. And then people see a viral TikTok or a YouTube or a website, they go off their birth control. Now they're pregnant. And, and, and that person who was selling that supplement doesn't have to worry about anything, you know, just, just gets away with it. And it just bothers me, this lack of informed consent, which I agree we as healthcare providers in that 15 minutes, it can be hard to do. But instead of making crazy claims like this causes cancer and this does this, talk about the full spectrum here and always ask, you know, who are these people? Are they credentialed? Are they making money off of me? What's their motive for educating? And I make TikToks and I, I'm not selling you a product. I mean, yes, I have a book here and whatever, buy it or get it from the library. I don't care, but I'm not directly selling you supplements. We, if we did, we, we could have our med school loans paid back in no time flat, but that's not ethical. And yet other people get away with it. And it just bothers me especially as women and people with the uterus historically have been so taken advantage of in healthcare. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, we're seeing these people take advantage, you know, they're basically slipping into the big gap that the patriarchy is vacating. And in, from my mind, actually, these things are patriarchal. It's patriarchal to lie to people about their bodies. It's patriarchal to take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's a, that's a big sort of predatory thing, supplements. Yeah. There's so much overlap, you know, we're seeing, you know, now with, you know, you and I have been sort of sounding the alarm about this stuff for a long time. And now we're seeing with COVID, right? Like all this, what, you know, we see people harmed in the office in labor and delivery by misinformation, but now like everybody is getting to see what that's like, you know, people are being turned away from hospitals because they're filled because of people who refuse to be vaccinated. And so they're seeing this sort of real live, um, sort of they're living the consequences of the disinformation. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's not just, it's not just a hypothetical now. You made a great point. We're seeing people every day. We're seeing people who've lost their lives from misinformation. And what bothers me is that people are not being held accountable. And so in this day and age where this stuff is out there, where states are mandating things, the only thing that you can never have taken from you is your education and your empowerment. And that's why I think us putting out the content that we do in our books and in our social media 
now more than ever, it's important to fill in those gaps and to say, I'm not okay that my state said abstinence only education was okay, or wouldn't talk to me about this, or is telling me what to do with my body. Because if you're informed, you can know how to speak up. You can break that cycle if you choose to have kids and how you teach them. So it's not a foregone situation um, at all. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, when I was on book tour I, for the Vagina Bible, actually, and someone asked, you know, how can I make a difference? So she was this, you know, girl, maybe about 16 or 17. I said, why don't you think about going into politics? Yes. Yeah. You no, know, because it's Absolutely. sort of, we, we never sort of, you know, it's sort of, we, it feels like we don't talk about that as a career choice to mm -hmm. younger children, right? Um, right. Right. I'm 16, but you know, it's all perspective. Um, so, um, and we don't talk about yeah. that, like, you know, be the change. Think about that as a career. I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy career, but, um, right. and I, I think, think like, oh, I'm going to be a, you know, a Senator. And, and if you'd want to, that's great. But what have we seen right now is making the biggest difference are local politics. Yeah. So encouraging young people to say, Hey, start at your school level. When I talk about sex education, especially to parents, I say, get on your school board. You know, you there's ways to be influential and there's ways to speak up and especially as females to show younger people that you can be at the table and if they don't make it, you know, they don't make space, then either make your own table or bring a chair. Um, and it's important, like you said, and I think we as healthcare providers, we are so bad at that because we're so busy, right? In the office and we say, oh, somebody else will fix the problem. Well, here's what happens, right? States start taking away rights and then now we're being very reactionary to it. And so we really, it's really about the local elections too, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, people, you know, you, I always say, you know, you, it's very hard to be in sort of women's health and not be political because <laughs> you can't, I mean, either way you are, you basically are. No, it's so true, which I think is why I love our field because we have the ability to advocate. So, but I, so I have to say, so I, I, I did know that that you know, women's health would be pretty political when I went in. I actually specifically went in to do abortions. Um, but I didn't actually think that I sort of thought, and this was in the, oh my God, I'm dating myself. So I got into residency in 1990. So oh. I kind of thought like, oh, well, by the time I'm 30, this will be all, you know, this will just be like Star Trek, you know, where people just, right. you know, everybody gets the care they need and there'll be scanners and there'll be none of this political infighting. Or, yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. <laughs> And yet here we are. And yeah. And just today I was sitting next to somebody at my conference who's an OBGYN and she said, I practiced before, you know, or I, I, I'm so mad. I, I was there as a teenager protesting for Roe v. Wade and I, why am I having to do this again? And it's just, it's, it's demeaning and it's demoralizing, but we won't give up. I mean, Lord knows we're not going anywhere. So. Yeah. Well, I think, I think one of the amazing things though about social media and I've seen this with, with, you know, with your accounts and other accounts is that it really, you start to realize that you're not the only voice out there who's upset about things, right? Yes. So, you know, you think, you think, oh, I'm the only one who's upset about this, but then, you know, you see 50 other videos, you see all these other people that are upset. Right. You're, okay. It's not just me. Okay. They're, they're really, cause it really are strength in numbers. And I think that's one of the amazing yeah. things that, that, you know, videos like yours can do is that they can actually see that wow, okay, like a million people are interested in this video. Yeah. I'm not alone. No. Yeah, and there's really good data out there. Um, I just did a presentation on social media and medicine, um, which was great, but also kind of sad when you see some of the data out there. But 90% of Americans aged 18 to 24 would believe health information if it was shared on social media by somebody they knew, meaning that if their Uncle Joe or their Aunt Sally post something about the COVID vaccine, they're more likely to believe it as opposed to somebody who's actually an expert in the field. So what I wanna do with social media and what you're doing is we are becoming those trusted people because they see us over and over. They see that we're normal people. They start to see, hey, she's got our best interest in heart. She's evidence-based. I, you know, I trust her because she talked about X, Y, and Z. So when it comes to these somewhat controversial things, if they see us posting on it, they're more likely to, to, to believe it than somebody else who maybe doesn't have the expertise. So I have gotten countless of messages messages from people who said, because of your content about the COVID vaccine or anything about feeling like I could go to the gynecologist for the first time in my life. Oh my gosh. Um, they were able to do it because they, because of us. And that's a huge, that's a huge benefit. I'm so jealous. Your cat has a tail. Our, we got a pandemic kitty named Herbie. He sadly, he does not have a tail, but we joke that he has a tail envy at all cats that he sees. So it's a good thing. He's not here right now watching. <laughs> 
little Luna who um, has one eye and it's gross and um, <laughs> it's really it's so disgusting. Um, but she's a sweetheart. She's like six pounds. And actually, we we've, we've had uh, we have we've had a lot I've had a lot of construction, and um, I I she can't see very well at all, but she is an excellent mouser. Oh, uh, two weeks ago I saw her walking by and I'm like, what is that in your mouth? Holy shit, she caught a mouth. Anyway, so that's how she I knew it. Her senses now. She can, wow. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad Luna, you know, made an appearance for a little show. It's like, Thank I need to talk about. Um, Herbie, he's Herbie the cat. Yes, we got him in the middle of the, right, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. And yeah, he's, same thing. We're doing construction in our house right now and he's terrified and not living his best life, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, it'll be worth it. <laughs> about your very first tiktok video oh it was so it was so benign jen and it didn't go through the censorship it was me pointing like this was back before i was like even afraid to talk on camera and so it was that nope yep track i don't know if you remember it oh uh -huh, yeah, yeah yeah i mean like super easy like if you can do this you can tiktok and I was like do you have to have sex when your boyfriend asks I was like, nope you know should you use protection yep you know that sort of thing can you go to the doctor and that didn't make it through. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I used a word like sex or what. I don't know. But I just reposted it the next day. And then it went up and I got a million views. And it was, this was before the pandemic. And I remember waking up in the morning. I was like, huh, well, I guess this is me now. This is what I'm doing because here we are. Um, and I first focused on a lot of birth control content because at that time, my audience was a bit younger. And mm -hmm. just with TikTok usage, you know, the demographic has changed. But um, and so now I, I talk about a, a wider variety of things. Um, right. And it's been fun. I, you, I mean, you know, when you first went on TikTok, you're like, am I really doing this? You know, <laughs> you get called, you know, okay, boomer or whatever. And I was like, yeah, yes, yes, here I am. <laughs> but you're watching and I know you're taking notes. <laughs> so, um, so that must've been kind of crazy, right? Like a million views overnight. That's like, that's a lot of, you know, even now that's a lot for a video. Yeah, it's a bit much. I mean, I was on Instagram, but that's definitely a different a different vibe and not, you know, you can't go, you tend not to go as viral there. Um, and it was exciting, but it was also, it's also like an, an oh shit moment. So there goes the expletives where you think, okay, you and I, we're not normal, you know, we're not just influencers who are doing makeup tutorials, although thank God for those people. Um, but we're your physicians first. And so everything that we put out has to be evidence-based. I mean, if I get something wrong, which I have absolutely. And I've, I've owned up to it, but you want to have the right staff. You want to have the references you want because if you don't have your name, what do you have? Um, so then when you realize all those eyes are on you, you're like, oh, okay. All right, let me go do my continuing medical education for TikTok now, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, now, you're a hospitalist, right? A laborist or? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't know if everybody knows what that is. So I thought it might be um, good for you to explain yeah. that. Yeah, and it's great because I'm at the Society of OBGYN Hospitals meeting right now, and it's the first meeting that I've gone to in person since COVID, and it's just, it's amazing to see my colleagues. It's so fun. Um, but yeah, so I care for pregnant people in the hospital. So if they come into our triage unit, which is basically an emergency room for pregnant people, they get admitted into labor, like, you know, deliveries, postpartum rounds. Um, we are the ones when there's emergencies on the floor, we respond to all of them, even if they're not our patients. So it's really fun to be sort of the leaders in, in those sorts of things, which is somewhat crazy. But if you're an OBGYN, there's a part of you that likes that adrenaline rush. Um, and we get to work really closely with our high-risk OB colleagues, which I really enjoy because I find high-risk pregnancy to be super interesting. Um, and when we can get people who are in a really scary situation to a good place, I really enjoy it. What I miss from that work is that I'm not in the clinic regularly. And one of my favorite populations in clinic was um, the adolescent population, the family planning, the contraception, um, that ongoing relationships that I would have with patients and the education. And so that's why I like social media so much. I feel like it's my therapy. I get to do all of that stuff. Um, and it's just for fun on the side. And it's, it's, just, it's just a nice creative way to do it. So do you sort of plan your TikToks out in advance? Do you just do things on the fly? Tell me a bit about your creative process. Yeah, yeah you know, my, my whole thing. Um, I do. I tend to try to plan and I batch content because I've got a lot of things going on. You know, I've got two kids and a, a job, like an actual job and, you know, yeah. like stuff. So I try to batch content and just things that people will send me or that I find interesting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing that goes viral is always the one that you put off the cuff in like, 20 seconds in response to like a current event or just something that you didn't think would be that interesting. And then before you know it, it's got 
2 million views and you're thinking, oh, okay. So why did that get all that? But when I just spent three hours researching something, nobody has watched that, but okay. Um, yeah. But it's <laughs> yeah, really interesting too, because it is, you know, and uh, I mean, because, you know, you'll also have other off the cuff stuff that doesn't go, but it's always amazing to me, like what, what people are like super interested in. And I think a lot of it is back down to sort of like the things that we don't talk about, the things that are perceived as being shameful, right? Yeah. And just stuff that, that, you know, what I love about social media and what also makes me really frustrated is seeing so much of the misinformation that I didn't even know was out there. Like, I didn't know it was a thing that people thought melatonin canceled out birth control. I, I never knew that that was a concern. And then when I got on TikTok, I thought, what the heck is going on? And, and then you see more and more things and these myths and they're deeply held. And that gives us an opportunity to address them. And if I'd never joined, I, I would have no idea. And so, yeah, it's, it's those things that I'm like, seriously, people want to hear about this, but they do because nobody else is talking about it, you know? Yeah. Um, and the it strangest gives, thing. Yeah. It also gives you some insight. Like when you see somebody in the office and they're, yeah. you know, they finally, you're like, well, did you hear about this on social media or something? And they're like, oh yeah, I did. Okay. Well, let me tell yeah. you why that's incorrect. And right. you know, um, it's, it does help. It is helpful to know. I mean, when I was a resident, so like, the internet didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> it barely existed for me, which I think was great. So <laughs> it was kind of nice. It was simpler. <laughs> but I used to read People Magazine and the National Choir and stuff, and, you know, because people would bring magazines in, you know, they still do, I'm sure, for labor and delivery, right, to read and stuff. And so they'd get left around. And so while you're waiting for someone to deliver, I'd like pick up People Magazine and I'd be reading yeah. like about the latest because, you know, fads right. and trends or Reader's Digest, yeah. like, you know, put Reader's an onion in your sock. Or whatever. Yeah. 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 And it's just, it's I, what I, what you said, you know, like it's kind of fun when you walk into a room and you're like, Hey, you see this thing on TikTok about, about X, Y, and Z. And they're like, wait, you heard about it? And I was like, oh, I've heard about it. here's why it's not true. And, they, and then they, you know, they're just like, okay, she, they're normal. We can talk about these things. We don't have to be ashamed. Um, and it's fun. Now, one thing that I find so fascinating is that uh, the language of sort of big natural is also the same language of purity culture, mm -hmm. right? So yes. pure, clean, natural, and they try to actually yeah. scare our women about, you know, it's all these hate, health halo words, exactly. Yeah. And um, it's, it's just fascinating to me. Uh, and when you see, you know, the sort of the super, the anti-vaxxers on the left and the anti-vaxxers on the right, they're like either Jesus loving mama or natural loving mama. And they're sort of basically like they've overlapped. They're like the same people. And um, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I don't have anything else to offer except being fascinated by it, but I'm just. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's hard when you see the same thing that what these people are railing against. And I get it, you know, huge profits from pharmacological companies, um, you know, sort of that patriarchal, this is how you have to do things. Um, the same things that they're against, and I totally can agree with to a degree, that's the response is, you know, you have to listen to us, this isn't true, and you have to buy this product, and nobody's listening to you, and it's just, it's weird, because the vast majority of people are, are somewhere in the middle, and they really just want information, but it's these loud voices on either end that have these, you know, like the disinformation dozen, who are 12 people who are responsible for 65% of the misinformation on social media, have led to the deaths of people, have led to the distrust and the issues that we're having right now in medicine. And it's not fair because um, that's not what the majority of people are thinking, but they have the loudest voices for sure. Yeah, I mean, I believe that Dr. Christiane Northrup is responsible for every pregnant person who's in the ICU with COVID. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. know. So the background for this, for those people who are watching, this is a board certified OBGYN who was responsible for a huge amount of misinformation when it comes to COVID and many other things. Um, and she still carries on her board certification, despite her clearly not following guidelines, being completely not evidence-based, but people listen to her because of her title, her name, her reach, her social media prowess. And it's hard for people to know what's legit and what's not. I don't blame people for falling for this stuff. I blame our own organizations for not policing this better. Well, and I mean, you, I mean, Jen is the real deal. She got a petition together and sent it to the American Board of OBGYN to say, hey, look, this woman is harming our profession. She's harming people. Like you need to take her board certification or you need to do something about it. And still, still yeah. nothing. Crickets. I'm not done with that yet. We're going to do something, but it, it shouldn't be this hard, right? People deserve to know that if they're going to see somebody in the office, that they can do what they say they can do. They practice safe medicine. 
And we need to be better about self-policing ourselves so that people will trust us and not run to these, you know, outliers on either side. It, yeah, it bought, and that's why I think we need to be on social media. We need to show people that we're relatable. We need to write these books to so they they get good information. Your books, I mean, how much of it is is references, right? And the same thing with mine. Alas, there's tons of pages of references because we want to give people the tools to say, hey, don't believe me. Look it up and see, and then decide. And you know, it's just it's empowering. People need to feel empowered and know that they can go to trusted sources and not be taken advantage of. Okay, so I want to do some word association stuff because I know you like games. Yeah, maybe one day we can play uh, Cranium. I thought I loved Cranium. Does anyone I play that anymore? I have played it, but I would love to play um, Cards Against Humanity. Oh my god, I did that with my kids, and they are like, they're, they're oh my, do I have to tell you? Oh my god, tell you a story about your cookies. So Jen sent me the <laughs> loveliest cookies, um, one with the uterus and ovaries and the other, other basically this, uh, you know, the flower from the front, but more with a vulva in the center. And totally I have two boys, totally uh, yeah. one boy who's, who's gay and he calls himself a platinum gay because he's never touched a vagina because he was born by C-section. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and then the other one who's very straight laced although the very straight laced one who like never never cracks jokes about anything mm. for humanity oh my god the yeah. potty mouth stuff that came out out of that so <laughs> I, i'm gonna I'm prepare yourself so that i'm gonna say you know a joke here that is obviously um you know x well not x-rated but the so the kids, yeah. the kids were trying to decide who would eat which cookie and they're like well you know the sugar went over and victor just turned his over and ate it but oliver um oliver said he was going to eat the one with the vulva and i said i bet that's the only time you're ever going to eat out is it i'm so glad that i helped inspire that moment for your child <laughs> he went, mom, oh, <laughs> you know, and I think that when you have a really open environment and talking with yeah. you about sex, it's never a big deal. And, um, you know, he, uh, he thought it was funny. He's like, and they wanted me to tell you those were amazing cookies. Oh, thank you. They came from, um, mama's cookies based out of, um, Wonton, New York, Long Island, which I, I grew up on Long Island and it was funny. It came up, but yeah, I was like, so I'm going to send you some pictures. I don't think you've designed cookies like this before, but it's going to be awesome. And she was like, great job. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, do some, let's do some word association. Okay. Um, okay. Vulva. Pubic hair. Okay. All right. Do you want me to give you one? Should we trade off or? Okay. okay. Banana. Potassium. <laughs> On. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Um, wet wipes. Um, no, just say no. <laughs> I'm no, thinking I'm, in the vulva region since we're thinking about vulvas right now. So, yeah. Yeah. although okay. you know, they're never marketed to men. If men can wipe their assholes, why can't women? Like, I mean, seriously, like, anyway. Um, okay, all right. Uh, all right, I'm gonna give you one discharge. It's normal. Thank you. That was the one I, I was like, she's going to say normal. She's going to say. And if also, I wrote these down on a piece of paper that I hid. I was like, if housekeeping sees that I'm randomly writing down these words, they're going to be like, what's happening? What's going on there? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And if you want to see what normal looks like, I showed my underwear on TikTok. Yeah. Like her real underwear, you guys. Like, and like, that's just normal. That's just like real underwear. Things. And like, like yeah, so. I know. Okay. Somebody was complaining about like, oh, you shouldn't have a warning thing. I'm like, really? Do you say that for all those people doing all those pimple extraction videos? I don't think so. So anyway. Um, all right. Okay. I have one more word for you. Oh, okay. Orgasm. Ooh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, words I can say. Breasts? Breasts. Oh, nipples. Normal. Wonderful. Totally great. <laughs> what's the best nipple cream you're a lactation consultant what's that what, what's the one that you recommend for people you know honestly i'd say if you're concerned that you you need to put cream on it or you're having issues then i would like you to come see a lactation consultant first Ooh. because if you're having pain just like with vaginal discharge and how we often misdiagnose yeast infections it can be very hard to to sort of manage things when it comes to breastfeeding and you're in the heyday and you're exhausted and your nipples are cracked and bleeding and so yeah a lot of times putting stuff on it um, can make it 
worse because it can be oh. sort of a yeah a medium. But my favorite, if you're going to put anything on it, are these little cool gel things, soothies that you put barrier if you're having trouble where it's hurting rubbing on your bra. But see, I learned yeah. something because you know what I like. I was fifteen. Uh, like my kids are eighteen, fifteen or mm -hmm. eighteen, um, and I'm breastfeeding anyway. And, uh, you know, I haven't, you know, been on a labor and delivery room for 15 years. So, you know, I asked. Yeah, we, used use, we used to use lanolin a lot and I used it too, but there's actually no data to support that it's any better than not using it. Isn't so it you and I are the same where we're like, less is more, is there data, you know, and again, if it works for you, use it, but yeah, we, we yeah. make we do too much, right? You yeah. wipe front to back, pee after sex, wear this, da, 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 like, and some things are good, but I, like you, I only want to tell people the things that really have benefit versus yeah. all the other shoulds, because otherwise you'll should yourself to death. And it, do you think guys do that? No, they don't. Okay. So I've got some questions here. Oh, I'm let's do it. Yeah, let's do a Q and A. Before we do that though, I did see somebody in the comment mentioning the um, Portland um, reproductive rights um, or Portland March for Reproductive Rights on October 2nd. And if you're local to Portland, please join us there. I will be there um, or donate or find your local one. I just wanted to get a plug. Okay. So this first question is this really good one. How does a single father talk to his tweener daughter about menstruation and sex when she thinks it's gross to talk about that with her father? Okay, well, so first of all, you're going to get this book because this book is perfect for her. <laughs> and you can buy it grouped together um, with the Vagina Bible that I highly recommend. But Joking aside, I think it's great that you were even asking that question rather than just being like, I don't know, ask your teacher or, Ugh. Um, and I get it. Some kids don't want to hear about it from their parents, especially if it's a dad, but I think it's great to, you know, to normalize the conversation as much as you can and say, listen, I'm happy to talk to these things, talk to you about these things, but I get it. If you don't want to, here's some resources. And there's actually a really good program and website that I like called Girlology, and they have a guyology too, and it's um, online resources and online classes and a book or two books actually, and live classes if they come back again. And it's um, a company, or it's a pediatrician and an OBGYN who put these together. And there's these courses and they're great. They're for the younger crowd. You've got puberty and what to expect. And then the older crowd, um, you know, about sex and that kind of thing. And it's cool because you can watch these little segments on your own or with your kids. Um, but I think also if you can as your as your daughter gets older bring them to the OBGYN just for an introductory visit not to have an exam the American College of OBGYN recommends it between ages 13 and 15 and it's so that there's that trusted adult where she can say I don't want to ask my dad this but I really need help about this she's got somebody on her side and she knows right. who she can go to um, yeah, and some offices too also sometimes have like educational evenings and stuff like some of the medical centers do and stuff so you might even ask um you know about that yeah. Okay. If you could only give one piece of advice to women about their gynecological health, what would it be? Speak up, speak up. Um, and that there's no shame because so many problems that I see are from people who were too afraid to speak up. And again, I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming our culture and how women think that their bodies are supposed to be. So if something doesn't seem right, come see us and let us know. And if you don't feel heard, it's time to go see somebody else. It is always okay to get another opinion because as much as I would love to believe that every OBGYN and every physician out there is open, understanding, and inclusive, and I understand there's a lot of assholes out there too. And there's another word, but we warned you. Um, and I apologize for that because I don't think it should be that way. I don't think you should only have access to specialists and good doctors if you live in a city as opposed to more rural. But unfortunately, that's, that's where we kind of are. And so empowering yourself to know like you can speak up if there's a problem, um, puts the ball in your court and you deserve that. You deserve to be seen and heard for sure. What about you? What would you say your most number one? Um, I think speak up as well. I think that um, ask questions is probably, um, yeah, I think that that's, that that's a really good answer. Um, get a second opinion. I think that's, yes. you know, if you, if something doesn't sit right with you, um, yeah. get a second opinion. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. You should do it. <laughs> 36 year old who had a hysterectomy last year because of fibroids. It left my ovaries in to, con to continue to regulate my hormones. No one told me anything about what to do, um, what to expect from menopause with over with ovaries, but no uterus. Um, they let, so she's got her ovaries, no uterus. Can you mm -hmm. advise? We can't give specific medical advice. So just, this is kind of yeah. a general. Yes. So we are doctors. We're not your doctors. Important to clarify. 
Um, but it's great that I left your ovaries in because they continue to make hormones. And so while you will not have the, oh, my periods have stopped for a year, that's how I'm going through menopause because your periods are, you know, are gone because right? they took your uterus. Yay. Um, you may have other symptoms and that could be hot flushes. Um, it could potentially be vaginal dryness. It, you know, the average age of menopause is about 52 in the United States. And if you want to prepare, I think that the menopause manifesto written by Dr. Gunter is a fantastic read. And I'm, I'm like, I'm serious. Um, even in my OBGYN residency, I don't think we got enough when it comes to menopause education. And I think it's great to know what to expect, what can help, how to stay ahead of the game, because so many, even OBGYNs who take care of menopausal women, um, they're not always the most up to date when it comes to recommendations. So that's a great question. So Dr. Lincoln, would you say your book is appropriate for teenagers? That's, I, that's a great question because I, I, my answer is it depends. So this book is not the first book, you know, you're going to have a period and here's what they're like and breast development. So I say my book is the follow-up book to that um, because I do talk about things that I think are not controversial or ooh, at all, you know, like what's a normal period color, what's discharge, but I do get into other things like, is it okay to have anal sex or how do you clean sex toys or um you know, that kind of stuff. And what I think, so in my mind, it's good for the older teenager. Everybody's different, but I think it's good for people all the way up into the perimenopause years. But if you want to specifically know what's covered, if you go onto Amazon and just go onto Amazon to see this, but then come back to Powell's to buy it, you can scroll through the look inside and you can see every question. So you can know exactly what it is. Um, my belief is that honestly, none of these topics are controversial. And like Dr. Gunter said, talking about these things doesn't make your kid do them. We have had studies that have shown that if you talk about birth control, it doesn't mean your kids are going to go out and have sex. So having these things out there isn't there. Trust me, they're finding it out anyway, but at least here, you know, they're going to get it in the right way. So, I mean, I think it's up to you, but I, I do think that don't wait too long because you want them to, to have this in their heads, this kind of good information before that way they can block and say, oh gosh, that's crazy. That's not true. Yeah. I mean, like the HPV vaccine, right? Like we recommend it, you know, way before kids are having mm -hmm. sex so they can be protected. And, you know, I, I've read the book and I actually think that, um, that, that a 12 year old could read this. If you have a 12 year old who is active on social media, then they are savvy enough to read this book. Not all of the parts are going to apply to them, but you know, 12 year olds are going to skip over stuff that they don't want to read. Yeah, and that's so true. So I totally think that you, if you had a 10 or 11 year old, you get this book, tell me I bought it. You just put it on the bookshelf because you know what? You never know when they're going to go and pull it off the shelf and yep. start looking at it. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised. So, you know, there's nothing in here that is scary. Um, right. You know, it's the human body and you don't want them to think it's scary. So I would yeah. say open up for sure. Um, that's just, you know, having spent a lot of time sort of thinking about like where my book would fit in, which is a slightly yeah. older audience, yeah. but I think, I think you could go from 12 and up and, um, and yeah. then we'll see. So, so everything like 12 my, and book, my book is like the gateway drug to the vagina Bible. I feel like they work very well together, <laughs> but that is a, no, I appreciate you saying that. Cause I, I agree. If you have it there, you're showing your kids that it's okay to talk about these things and you want them to come talk to you as opposed to running to TikTok. I mean, yeah, I'm there, but there's a bunch of wackadoodles there too. So yeah. you, want, you want them to come to you. And buying this book shows them that you're open, right? That And that if they can't answer the question that they're gonna find, that you're gonna find the answer for your kid. So that's what I would say. So what's normal for vaginal discharge? Dun, dun, dun. Yes. I mean, we get that question a lot. So I don't want whoever's asking that to think that that's weird or strange. And I don't blame you because we never talk about it in school. So it can be normal to have up to a teaspoon of discharge a day. And if you actually look at that, that seems like a lot. Um, but a teaspoon, and it can be clear to white, to even a light yellow, it can vary throughout your cycle, um, as opposed, you know, your hormones are doing different things. And it can have no scent to a very light scent. It should not cause itching or burning or have an odor that's so strong that you think, oh gosh, something's wrong um, or causing any you know, discomfort on the vulva. And if you have any of those symptoms, then we would definitely want you to come check us out and don't try to self-treat at home. And some people have no discharge or not a whole lot that they can see and, and others have more than others. And there's a wide variety of what's normal. And if you're not sure, let us know. All right, I've got one that I know that they, that's right up your alley. Regarding supplements, I keep seeing flow vitamins everywhere. Thoughts on this? 
Oh, Flow Vitamins. Okay. Yeah. Clearly I'm not sponsored for any of these products. Um, so if you haven't heard Flow Vitamins, they're these little gummies that are marketed for PMS support and relief. And does PMS suck for some people? Absolutely. The ingredients they have in these vitamins, there's a couple herbal ingredients. And then um, there, I think there's magnesium, but there's not like the evidence-based dose and there's no calcium, which is really strange because when it comes to data to help with PMS, calcium can actually help quite a bit. So long story short, I would save your money. There actually are some other supplements like calcium magnesium that could help with PMS and you could buy them as a standalone and they'd be a heck of a lot cheaper. Um, and if you say, well, what's the harm in buying this? I mean, if it works for you, fine. But if you are giving these companies your money, you're telling them that what they're doing is working rather than them thinking, oh, wow, maybe we should do some studies to prove that our products actually help. And so the cycle continues of the taking advantage of people who you know, have issues like PMS who are too afraid to bring it up with their healthcare provider. So I would save your money and buy something more fun than those flow vitamin gummies for sure. Yeah, and what those companies do is if you haven't, you know, if you have, like we watch this space a lot is, mm -hmm. is you know, about every year or two, they come up with a new product because they know that, that the placebo effect is going to wear off and then you're going to move on to something else. And they also get you because they want you to buy it every month. So they gave you a subscription. So yeah. it's kind of like kind of scammy stuff. Okay, so there's yeah. a nice thing. I want to read this out. So I was going to see when people say nice things. Thank you, Obi Jens, for being leading voices and advocates for women's health. Oh, that sounds like Obi, um, like sort of like Star wars -y too, right? Like yeah. Like Obi Jens, Obi, yeah. Obi, um, <laughs> Obi Jens for being leading voices and advocates for women's health. The effort you put into social media content is astounding, and I believe you've reached so many young people who otherwise might, might not have had credible sources on women's health to turn to. How do you think about your ability to change the hearts and minds of legislators, older, skew male? Do you think yourself playing a role? Do you see yourself playing a role in influencing policy at the state or federal levels? Oh, that is so kind. I think that's so nice that somebody recognizes the amount of work it takes. So thank you from both of us. Um, I will tell you if my husband's watching this right now, and I think he is, um, if I tell him, oh, I'm running for office tomorrow, he might be like, Jen, you already have enough jobs. It's time to stop. However, I do, I absolutely do believe that I need to be in this space. And so that um, Reproductive Rights March that's happening October 2nd, I will be there and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be speaking at it. And I think this is the first step. Um, you know, in these sorts of things is being involved, showing up, being a voice, getting your voice out there, even when people don't like you and your comment, wonderful and beautiful. And I get so many of those, but I guarantee there's a lot of other people who don't like us too, for what we're doing, but it's these kinds of comments and knowing that we're helping people that makes us want to continue on and we're not going anywhere. So you, if you asked me two years ago, if I was going to be on TikTok or like writing a book, I would have said, absolutely not. I'm too busy, whatever. So I never say never to anything because you just don't know where your path is going to take you, right? I mean, Jen, did you see yourself as like the guru of Twitter and writing books? I mean, when you were like back in your OBGYN residency, I think it's nothing we predict, but sometimes things just happen when you're in the right place at the right time. So Yeah. I mean, I think it's sort of like, you know, okay, well, one door shut, but here's another path. Let me see what's down this path. But I totally think you should run for politics. Right. Are you hearing that, Manny? <laughs> Oh, I appreciate that. Oh, I can totally see that, you know, Senator Lincoln and President Lincoln. <laughs> well, my husband is an indirect descendant of President Lincoln, of Abraham Lincoln. So, wow. so yes, yeah, so we have all the memorabilia and he knows all the facts. And I can guarantee you, my children, that'll be a part of their childhood is going here and going there. And it's cool. It's super cool. But I'm, I'm just Mary Todd along for the ride. <laughs> And she got it. She got a. She got the short shaft. She had a. She had a hard life. So. Oh, I, I know like That's the, the for another day. American <laughs> historical politics, having grown up in Canada, so uh, which I've forgotten all my historical Canadian politics too. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. Um, okay, let's see. Um, how can regular folks help take down doctors like the one you just described? That is crazy and infuriate, infuriating. I'll write a letter. Is there a way we can help? I love that. It's, it, it takes all people, the more voices who speak out. So if you follow these people and you realize that they're not legit, you stop following them, you report them for misinformation. And I'm a huge believer that if somebody is a medical professional acting in this way, you do need to speak up. So whether it's reporting them to their state board or to their licensing board, and it may feel like you're telling on them, but just think about how many people have died because of people out there spewing this garbage and spewing this misinformation. And your voice 
um, your voice makes a difference. And so if you can do that, and then I think the biggest thing you can do is talk, talk to your friends and say, you know what? I know we saw this the other day and, and actually that's totally not true. You can make such a huge difference in your little group because that spreads, you know, when one person listens and then the next. Um, so speaking up, speaking out and not being afraid to, to say, hmm, you know, maybe this doesn't sound right. Um, but I love that you are as infuriated and as enraged as we are because it's, because it is, it totally is. And it means you're paying attention. Right. Um, and uh, maybe I've got one last question here. Wow. Um, can you talk about racism and how it intersects with health disparities in your work? Yeah, I mean, it does. That's the answer right there. We all have implicit bias. And especially in our field and OBGYN, the disparities that we see in racial um, more, uh, maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States is continuing and it's not getting any better. If anything, it's getting worse. And it's a problem when only 2% of physicians um, are black. And so women who we know tend to feel more comfortable with people who look and are from their same culture have a hard time finding somebody who looks like them or who understands them. And so I, we need to change that. We need to change the pipeline. Um, we need to acknowledge that we do have biases and we need to learn from other people. What I love about my Instagram feed is that it's about 50% people who don't look anything like me. And I love learning from other people who have different backgrounds and cultures um, and listening and being like, oh, I got that wrong. And here's how I'm going to make it better. Um, so I think we have a huge ways to go. I think reading and just being open and listening to other people and not just whitewashing things and saying, oh, I know better because X, Y, and Z. Um, but I could go on for hours about that. <laughs> So I think we're getting close to running out of time, but so what's next for Dr. Jen Lincoln, besides like running for politics? <laughs> um, you know what? I just, I'm just so thrilled to see this book out into the world because I'm sure you felt the same way you poured over something and you just want people to have a place to go and to feel like they can get good information. And so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep fighting, especially with what's going on in Texas. I am not going anywhere. Um, and I'm just excited to see how this helps people. And I would love if people are interested to use the let's talk about hashtag, tag me in things, because we need to start talking about these conversations more and destigmatize and break down these barriers um, and educating and empowering ourselves. Oh, well, I'm so glad I got to be part of your launch. I feel like I was sort of like your, your birth attendant. You were, you do led my book, Jen. And honestly, it's because of people like you who have created this space for people like us who are continuing this. I just, I look up to you so much. So I'm, I'm so honored that you were, that you were here tonight. So thank oh, you. Oh, me and, and Luna. And Luna. <laughs> One-eyed Luna. <laughs> oh, she's so cute. Oh, I don't think she's, I think she's beautiful. Oh, she's the most beautiful ugly cat in the whole world. So, you know, like, she's also, like, missing teeth, and she has cat acne, and so, you know, um, but, you know, and, and she's a trouble getting in the litter rocks all the time, so. She needs a glow up. She'll get a glow up. She'll be good. <laughs> you know, she's good natured, and I love her, so. Oh, so sweet. Well, on that note, um, I would like to thank you both for joining us. This was a super helpful event. I'm glad everyone in the comments is really loving it. Um, you can buy Jennifer's book here at Powell's. Um, I included the link in the, I wish I could do this like while I'm looking at something. Uh, I included the link in the chat, but I'm going to repost it again along with Dr. Gunter's book as well. So that way you can, you know, buy them both. It, I mean, holiday seasons are coming up. This makes a great Christmas gift. Start that shopping early. Mm -hmm. um, you can find both of them on TikTok as well. So, you know, make sure your teens are listening to it as well because right. TikTok is for the youth and for us or for us. All right. And I'm going to post, last but not least, I'm going to post a YouTube channel for PALS if you're interested in looking at this event again or other events. Uh, most likely this one hopefully should be up by tomorrow, but you know, what else? <laughs> All right. But thank you two so much for joining us. And everyone else, have a really good night. Thank you and congratulations, Jen. Thank congratulations you. on your book. Thanks, Powell's. Love you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.